Uh, very happy to be speaking today with Matthias Kruner, uh, the CEO and co-founder of a very, very innovative bank in Germany, uh, right. of all places. Not, not a country that you would, um, you would relate to innovation in financial services, but Fido Bank started in 2006. Nine. 2009. Um, and in a way, uh, setting the stage for or setting the new benchmark in terms of what uh, online banks should look like. But your own history is actually quite interesting in itself. You, you started by being a pioneer of, of uh, standalone banking concepts, um, which had, a, which had a, a brokerage feel to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit more about yourself first and how you okay. came to starting Fido Bank. Um, well, my background actually, I would first, first of all, I would say I'm a, a dedicated service person. Um, I'm, I'm coming out of the hospitality industry, so first of all, I'm thinking about the needs of a customer. That's my main priority. And then it happened to be that I was uh, kind of uh, employee number one of the, the mentioned DAB bank, uh, and we set up, yes, a rule breaking um, continental European discount brokerage focused bank concept uh, back in the mid 90s um, which to to my those days boss uh, w was not that rule breaking because he lived in the states before and and he came back to Germany and said listen why don't we do something like Charles Schwab uh, and we had a look to this uh, totally unexcited and said yeah why not so um, we uh, tried to understand not copy, but understand the concept and converted it for European circumstances. So what did you learn from that experience? Because from what I remember, the Charles Schwab online model didn't really take off uh, because the advisory component was still very important. Um, and the whole idea of, of a supermarket of financial products online uh, for brokerage products or for even for insurance uh, um, you know, there, there are no major players in the marketplace today. Well, um, I think it worked. Um, I think there is a significant market size for people who do not need advice, who want to make up their own decision. Uh, I think uh, that a lot of people uh, see it in a way that a bank is not supporting you in terms of advice, but is only selling something. Uh, and if I, if I listen or follow the conversations in the net, uh, I see no proof that this should be not right, you know, so uh, I think this is still a, a valid mega trend uh, that people are simply not trusting. Um, I think also that uh, the financial crisis itself caused another reason for distrust. Um, and I think it is very important that people have a variety. So uh, what uh, Schwab did with the fund supermarket, and we, we had it as well at DAB Bank, was very well received. We've been number one distribution channel for a lot of funds, which normally would have had no chance to come to the German market, for instance. Uh, and the customer was happy to have an alternative to the mainstream uh, or high street offers, actually, which are normally sold to him. Uh, so I think this is uh, an ongoing trend. Uh, I think furthermore that banks cannot afford to give advice to any mass market retail customer. So this customer needs to have a support uh, in another way uh, because those customers have a lot of questions on the one hand. On the other side, they want to solve the issues on their own. Tell us about at which point did you come to um at a personal comfort level that a bank like Fido will take off in Germany. And what is what was the proposition? Is it a simple asset liability business or that there's a huge fee-based component which has to do with, you know, from what I can see, uh, more on services like payments, remittances, and so on? Mm. Um, well, we, we did a, uh, after I left the EB Bank in late 2002, running this bank for almost 10 years then, um, we uh, did a, uh, the founders of Fider and I, we did some investments in, in I would say, web 2.0 based peer-to-peer -peer thinking concepts. So there was one, for instance, uh, one peer-to-peer skill-based gaming platform. There was a social media platform we invested in in Germany. And all those investments actually gave us a first-hand 
and, and hands-on information about how, how these platforms are running. What is the DNA of it? What, is, what does it mean to, to be very close to the, to the user base? What does it mean to have a user-to-user -user interaction and integration? Um, and really seeing that and learning it f from scratch for us. And that was a very interesting learning curve, actually. That was like an intern uh, in one of those concepts. And uh, back in 2006, actually, uh, we thought about it in the team that uh, this peer-to-peer -peer Web 2.0 behavior is changing the relation from a customer to his or her company service provider. And, and we thought this will affect banks and in particular retail banking very, very strongly. And, and I think we've proven right. So that was the moment when, when we said, okay, so let's go for a new concept. So we filed for banking license uh, in 2007, briefly uh, before the crisis started. And, and um, in terms of getting the funding, uh, how much of it was self-funding at which point and at which point did investors become interested? So in this, in this phase of applying for banking license, we exactly had one then in the, in the course waiting for the license. We made it to get one institutional investor. Uh, I would say approximately 20% of the tier one or regulatory capital then was from this investor. The rest was coming out of our activities. Uh, today we have four. Um, institutional investors. Um, and at which point, uh, at which points in your history did you think about scaling? Um, I think that's the proof of concept bit. Uh, how many customers did you have at that point? And, and then now, how many customers do you have? And at which point do you think is there another um, upsurge in, in that regard? I, I, think, I think we are absolutely in the sweet spot of this moment um, for many, many reasons. So we have, a, on the one side, a very internal view to this, which means now having something like a little bit above 80,000 full KYC customers, 270,000 uh, users in our community, being the second time profitable now in five years, um, I think is a is a uh, a very nice milestone on the one side. On the other side, uh, we see a very very uh, opportunistic or no very nice window of opportunity in in favor for fintech or fintech related companies. Uh, suddenly, the investor in environment is is open to these issues, which was not always the case. And I would say until you know 18 months ago, it was not really the case. Um, so suddenly investors wake up, they understand that this is a huge chance for them, they understand that banks need to do something. Um, so this is exactly where we are in now mm -hmm. and uh, so far we had to grow in a way that we are really up eyeing the limits of course of our regulatory capital on the one side. We always had to have a very close look to our uh, loan to deposit structure. Uh, which is very conservative, you know, those are all the learnings and the outcomes and the consequences of the financial crisis. Uh, and now I think, uh, hopefully, hoping for a bigger round now, we have uh, then a, a big cushion of, of regulatory capital and then we put the foot on the gas, as we Germans love to do, you know. <laughs> right, well, yeah, given the autobahns, right? So the, the thing is that um, how, you, you talk like you're part fintech company and part bank. Yes. Is there an identity issue there, or are you fintech company and bank? We are, we are a tech-driven bank. We are a fintech company having a banking license. We are a community having a banking license. I don't see any reason to split that up. Uh, I would even say I would not understand why we should split it up, why we should separate it in fintech or bank. Uh, which would mean that a bank never is a fintech company. Uh, tell a banker you are not working on a computer tomorrow. The bank is not existing anymore, even that it is a branch bank. So banks need to be fintech. This is what I'm saying. Is, is My point is banks need to be fintech. A bank that is not a fintech company has a, a severe problem going on because they will not survive in the digital environment. It's, it's simply not happening. Um, so you need to be a fintech company to be a proper bank today. Right. Now, but having said that, if you look at the profile of a bank, um, uh, maybe a third of its staff are fintech related, um, you know, application development, uh, programmers, and, and so on. Uh, a third are, are business people, and, and a third are probably marketing people or sales and marketing or something like that. So um, for you to say that a, a bank is a fintech company, um, you, you, you are overemphasizing a, a certain element of that. Would I be correct to think yeah. that way? Tech. 
simple as that, because tech is driving many, many very important KPIs. Tech is driving, uh, for instance, the customer engagement. Uh, tech is driving uh, the cost of customer acquisition. Uh, tech is driving the customer retention, the customer stickiness of your deposits. Uh, tech is driving the scoring. Uh, tech is driving the data aggregation. Uh, of course, this is what tech can do. But if you haven't got the brain on the one side and on the other side the culture to do the right thing in this environment, tech doesn't help at all. So um, this is why I'm saying it's, it's both, actually. Um, how much of your income is fees? So um, out, of, out of the history of Fighter Bank, actually, we in, in early 2013 started Fighter Tech as a subsidiary. And uh, I can say that 60% uh, of our income is net interest margin. Roughly 10% is commission income related to transactions. And the remaining is tech-related income. So uh, pro uh, providing the white label tax? For instance, that, yeah. yes, for instance, white label. Uh, we, we recently signed a contract with a virtual mobile network operator in Europe. And we will provide white label banking, full stack white label banking for this party uh, under their brand using FIDO banking license, using FIDO operating system uh, for whatever kind of banking they want to have. Um, yeah, so this generates attack income, this generates whatever is used. Uh, and, used and in your books, it, it shows up as fee income for the tech. No, it's not. It's, 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 um, I wouldn't call it a fee. It's, it's tech-related income to me. Right. But from a traditional banking business, anything that's not net interest margin is fees. And if it is, if it is, it is. If it makes you happy. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, what is traditional? You know, and even the tradition came somewhere and was new some days. So, so to me, again, it's a tech, call it a tech, let's make a compromise, call it a tech-related fee. Uh, how much of your business is in mobile right now? Because I think the whole idea of a website-based internet banking uh, model is so old-fashioned that unless it was connected to something else, and specifically mobile, uh, it isn't going to work. So, um, so do you do you think of mobile separately from the rest of your initiative, or is that uh, pre prevalent in all of your initiatives? I think if you if you really want to have a successful mobile strategy. Um the app itself is the, the least thing you, you, you need to talk and think about. Uh, if you really want to have a mobile uh, philosophy which is successful, the full operating system must be in shape to deliver straight through processes, uh, mm. speed banking, mm. no matter whether it's whatever, midnight on whatever part of this planet, uh, a Sunday, doesn't matter at all. So the operating system itself needs to be in the shape to deliver speed banking seven times 24. If you can do this, then you can start thinking about a mobile app because then you can start think about what is a mobile, what is a contextual situation right. in which I need and use such a mobile product solution right. and what is the proper solution to do so. So our mobile strategy is, uh, first of all, the FIDO operating system itself must be in the position to be straight through in 60 seconds, um, first of all. Second, uh, our part of our strategy is to be open to APIs, via APIs for third-party offers, for right. instance, or to dock on to, to other uh, products and solutions which we regard to be interesting. And then, third, we think about what is a for whatever reason, native app or a Android widget or whatever. So all in all, mobile, <coughs> to answer your question, uh, mobile is extremely important uh, and is influencing everything what we do. Mm. But at the same time, uh, you tend to be very successful in certain business segments, maybe deposits, maybe remittances, um, you know, activity that seems to be very focused on a certain clientele or a certain type of clientele, which is, they're migrants. They, they're local. They're new to the local community. Um, you know that sort of thing. So how it seems to me. I mean, I'm just looking mm -hmm. at your profile. But if you were to describe it, uh, what does your uh, franchise represent in terms of you know types of people and so on, and how much of that has changed in the last one year or so? Well, I think we are very successful within within this part of the population, uh, which is thinking very very digitally, which is thinking and living in a very digital way, and I. I can see that in, in some proofs, actually. Uh, one is uh, we have a, 
a huge base of customers having an own homepage or running an own blog website uh, on the one side. So this is not normal. Um, and I think this will go down the bigger we will be, no mm. doubt about it. Mm. Uh, on the other side, we see that uh, our customers are using their card, for instance, for at least 50% in e-commerce. Um, so they are shopping online. They are they're communicating and sharing online. So this is where I can see that. Right. Um, and this is not surprising to me because uh, we are mainly communicating via social media. We are mainly um, kind of uh, treating bloggers uh, as very, public. very carefully right. and try to be very open to them. Right. Um, so we, we really embrace this digital population. Is there a change to that over the last years? I wouldn't say so. Um, it, of course, has its varieties. Uh, if you take our corporations with a Bitcoin exchange, uh, of course, this is driving a specific customer growth in this environment. Um, so we have some product and offering clusters that are generating uh, as well customer clusters. Uh, all of them have one common issue. All of this is a very digital issue. Where did the name come from? Uh, Fighter? Yeah. Well, actually, Fighter is, is a, a, a Latin impression, I have to say, of Fidere. Right. And, oh, okay. And Fidere means trusting. Okay. And to trust. And, and we thought that, you know, after the, the crisis, now we called ourselves Fighter before the crisis. But the crisis proved our name to be right, right. Uh, and, and uh, because we think that no matter what we talk about banking, the main thing in banking is trust, yes. and Web 2.0 yes. delivers us the appropriate tools right. to gain trust. Right, and, and therefore um, you would say you would you know, call yourself um, a lot more conservative in terms of um, just keeping the trust and not being not rocking the boat by keep changing things regularly. Well, you can be, but I would call it, I'm not sure if this is a proper English expression, but let's talk about it. I would call it value conservative. Okay. Yeah. So yes, we are conservative in our values. Yeah. This means we do not fool around. We, we, I regard it to be value conservative that we are uh, center, we put the customer in the center of our thinking and acting. This is a very conservative value. This is nothing new to the internet or by the internet. This what? should have happened before the internet already. But nevertheless, it's not a contradiction to be open for innovation. Uh, if this innovation is supporting those conservative values. Right. And, and yeah, it might sound paradox somehow, but right. it isn't. It's very consequent. What's, what sort of goals have you set for yourself, for Fido? Because you, you are in a marketplace with you know, several big players, I mean, like, several very big players. And, and the more you publish more information about yourself, you actually make it very clear where you are relative to the other players. So, so what's the goal? In, in, uh, what's the ultimate business goal? When we when we set the, set up the first bank, DAB Bank, back in 1995, uh, for we we thought by ourselves actually, why are the big banks not doing this? This is so obvious. Why are they not doing this actually? Right. Um, we did not. We we we. we might have some answers why they didn't do it, but at least they did not do it. So we have actually, this taught me not to be, have any kind of respect actually for the sheer size mm. of, of a potential competitor. Mm. On the other side, it shows us that there is a, a kind of big competition. There is room for even increasing niches, mm. uh, which is very interesting. Uh, third, we can speak openly about what we do. Why? Mm. Because I know that there is no big corporation in the company. speed, yeah. in the speed, which can cope with our development. I, I definitely know that, and I know that, and this is the other reason. In the time they maybe would copy what we do, if it's really the case. Yeah, in this time they copy what we do. We have ten new ideas anyhow. Mm -hmm. So we are very innovative culture in our bank. We try to really be super open to this. We, as I said, we integrate the customer to this development. And you can be sure this is kind of a intellectual crowdsourcing mm. of how mm. to innovatively develop this concept further on. Mm. That's, that's, and this, in a combination with a very authentical approach, right. makes it super unique. Um, and and what, are, what's, what is the immediate next plan for FIDO? Um, you know, uh, raising capital, raising deposits, um, what? So, um, now, as, as mentioned, yes, we are in this capital race now. Uh, I think we have some steps of success in the meantime, and I hope to, to succeed by, by mid this year in, in, a, in a major step. 
Uh, we are currently preparing our go-to-market for the UK. Right. Uh, web banking should be a global thing. Um, right. E-commerce is global. Why, why is e-banking not global? Yeah, that's because it takes bandwidth uh, away. Yeah. yeah, and I think there is a need for better banking everywhere. It's not only a German issue. You right. know, it would be totally ignorant to see it only as a German issue. No, no, there is everywhere a need for better banking. We really get attracted to different markets. So we have made our contracts with uh, our American friends. So you will see FIDO US coming up, mm. uh, as said FIDO UK. Um, you, we will cover step-by-step -step Europe. So we will grow into the regions, uh, into the hemispheres. And um, this is why I find it in particular interesting to be here in Singapore. Um, what, what do you see in Asia, uh, in Singapore particularly, or maybe even Hong Kong for that matter, that uh, makes a proposition like FIDO exportable? Well, first of all, it's the feedback from the people I'm talking to, first of all. I, I'm, I'm not in a position to say exactly. that it's exportable. I'm just in, fact, in fact, in our conversation, uh, one of the things that struck me was that all the assertions you're making, I had to qualify it whether where it came from, whether they were your assertions or the people you're talking to. Yeah. But you're saying that you're always talking to the people. So tell yeah. us a bit about you know, what you're hearing from the ground in places. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm, I would say in the last 36 hours, besides having very, very uh, less sleep, you know, yeah. um, that the feedback I received is, first of all, this idea of integrating the customer is something which obviously strikes people here, um, and, and which they say, that's new. Yeah. Um, in this offensive and very consequent way of doing it, that would be really new. Yes. Is this maybe an offer for everybody here? Maybe not. But it, it looks like this could be a significant niche, actually. Again, mm -hmm. um, again, I'm, I'm, we are not pledging to be a bank for everybody. And we do not pledge that this solution is for everybody. But we are always thinking in these niches. And are those niches in a, in a significant size existing? Mm -hmm. So yes, it seems to be a community-based integration. seems to be a concept which, uh, regarding the feedback, which, which could be applied in Asia as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, remember, to, sorry, one point. Indonesia, as we all know, is the second most active country on social media. Right. So you've got a lot of talkative people in right. here. So <laughs> it's not only the Italians being talkative. It's, right. Yeah. But um, what about er, uh, issues like security features? Um, how does that, um, you know, how <coughs> does that um, occupy the mind of a, of a potential customer? Oh, hopefully very much, because I, I just can say we, all of us, we should not underestimate this issue of digital security right. or cyber security, or I have always to say, also to say cyber neutrality, you know? So we really should be fighting very strong for a neutral use of the web. We should be uh, very much aware that the smartphone can be endangered, even more maybe endangered than your desktop that you have your antivirus software running in the latest status. Right. Of course, that's on the one side. On the other side, of course, we as a bank, you can believe this, are audited by the regulators in the sense as well. So we have to at the least to have, exactly. So we have to have a minimum standard, which is quite high. Right. Um, which, by the way, makes sense to be a regulated company, you know, right. in comparison to a company which might be dealing with your money and not being regulated. Right. Yeah. And why are you taking this to the U.S.? Because we got approached by U.S. partners. Um, it's, um, that's the one reason. So we got approached by different groups. Um, we were in the luxury situation to select an, an ideal partner, okay. uh, which we found. And we are looking forward for this partnership to make it alive uh, on the one side. On the other side, this the, this the kind of offensive move in it. On the other side, there's a kind of defensive move in it. Why? Because when we planned to go to the UK, uh, our advisors in the UK said, listen guys, uh, as soon as you're in the UK, the Americans see it and read it. So if you want to prevent that they copy it, you have to have an answer. Uh, and I'm happy that we have the answer now. And the answer is Fighter US. So here we are. So um, in terms of staff, you know, those working for you, whether here or elsewhere, uh, is there a certain model that comes about? Uh, is there a certain expectation of the kind of person it has to be? <clears throat> well, you must be, of course, an expert in your area, no doubt about it. Uh, but on the other side, even being an expert maybe in loan book management, in asset and liability management, in accounting, in risk management, right. in regulatory reporting, and I'm, I'm listing the more traditional uh, jobs in yeah. a bank, yeah. um, you need to have an understanding of what it means to be in social media. Mm. Um, I want to see that. 
I, I don't want you to be a, a heavy user, but I want you to understand what works. the mechanics is out of that, what the pressure can be if a social media discussion is starting regarding the interest rate on the loan book or the interest rate on the deposits, how to react on this. Yes. So it does not make sense that you only would leave it to a team that is dealing with social media and regard it as an in-house outsourcing. Mm. So they do the work with the silly users and we do the proper management and banking. Right. That does not yeah, make sense. So that must be a, heat, a, a very homogeneous culture Right. in respecting what is being discussed there, right. understanding, listening to it, reading it, and, and making the right conclusions out of that in every department of a bank. Now with the challenger banks in the UK, who, who are essentially like yourself, I mean, they're light, they lightweighted, they're small, and they are asset liability management businesses. They may not have taken your model of going online as fully as they did, but but they're there in the marketplace. So does it make sense to grow into new markets like, uh, the, like the UK? Oh, absolutely, it does make sense. And, and if we are not alone, the better it is, you know, because if you are alone opening up kind of a market segment, you are a freak. If it's a group, it's a trend. Uh, and, that's, and the trend is your friend, as we say. So it's, it's way better not to be alone, first of all. Second, it's way better not to be alone because then customer would have a comparison and okay. can, can really Challenge, challenge the concepts. Yeah. But, but as a boss, uh, would you be looking at the cost side of your business? Uh, uh, would you be looking at market share for market share's sake? Being a small bank, I'm not in the position to look for market share, but only I'm in the position for out return on investment, uh, earnings, and by that cost and income. That's right, first of all. I think now with the capital increase we want to do, we want to go more for market share. That, that is the growth strategy then. Uh, and b talking about cost, I can promise you one thing. There will be no challenger bank in the UK uh, operating on the cost level we do because we are running already on, on very efficient processes, first of all. And if I would share the cost of go-to-market, which we have in comparison to what I read in the newspaper or what I read in the web about uh, the one or the other uh, new entrants there as well, I just can say we are ridiculously low uh, in comparison to that. So what is your cost income rate? I'm not sharing. <laughs> uh, low as in lower than everybody else in the marketplace. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, in terms of uh, your income itself, um, you know, the, the kind of um, opportunity to sell yourself as a third party um, white label business and then also to compete in the same marketplace, uh, how do you make those decisions? Well, <clears throat> actually, um, the dimension example with this virtual mobile network operator. So first of all, I think we are definitely working in a different environment, both of us. Uh, second, this, this partner with, with all rights totally trusts on the power of his brand. So what can I say? Um, the brand is even more, uh, I would say, important in this environment than uh, whether this is a FIDO operating system or not. You know, uh, And I fully respect it and, and I'm very happy to have such a partner, for instance. Um, I, would, I would think maybe that this could be a question if we would have a kind of significant market share already, which we haven't, you know, it's, it's, it's totally fine. There is no conflict. And yourself, what have you learned in all the years that you've been in financial services and where are we uh, as, a, as a macro trend uh, in, in providing financial services? Because you started with the brokerage experience mm -hmm. and now you're here and we haven't even talked about mobile enough to see mm. what, what promise do you see in mobile and, mm. and where that can take you. Mm. In fact, maybe that's the next question. But, uh, but where do you think the industry is? Where do you think the customer is in expecting financial services without branch, without um, you know, real contact with the institution? <coughs> Yes, it's a, that's a very... Uh, Where was the customer 10 years ago? Yeah, yeah, that's a very exciting question because, uh, as we all know, for you now we are discussing for decades more or less, um, one decade, um, whether mobile banking will strike, whether mobile payments will strike, and there is not a year where we do not have a new buzzword coming around, like near field payment, whatever, you know. Um, so mainly those developments then more or less disappoint the ones who are waiting for that. But on the other side, I can say, I think, and, and, and I think it will be, um, I put a bet on this. On the other side, I think that all those kinds of development now 
really come together and, and will really do a big, big shift in, in, in terms of what it means to be digital, what it means to be uh, to run on a, on a straight through efficient process, what it means to have a proper data management. And this is what we are really talking about. It's not that we talk about that a bank should have a, a profile on Facebook. This is, yeah, that's nice but this is not what we talk about. It's not that we talk about a bank should have an app. Yeah, an app is nice, but if I do not have the process in my operating system that can service the, the specific context, I don't need the app. Um, so those are just kind of uh, the leaves of the tree, but what is the real tree to it? So uh, I think this is an increasing understanding on the bank side to, to really get it what it means to be digital what it means to have an operating system that is open to any kind of a currency, open to any kind of a value transport, not money transport. We always, bankers still think in, I send money. Yeah, that's one part of banking, that's right. But how about sending value? You know, what can be a value? It can be, you know... How quickly it, you send. Uh, yeah, I can, you know, once I got the question from a, a, uh, from a user, how about sending a time voucher? This is a value as well. You know, this is very, very philosophical. I love that discussion, not having an answer to that. But I love the thinking. You know what I mean? This is getting really, this is kind of breaking up existing barriers. Now, those users break those barriers. And we are listening, and it's very exciting to, to, to watch that conversation now happening. So I can say, and then I come to the user and customer, those customers are, are way ahead of us. Those customers are living in a blockchain environment. Right. You know, not talking about the Bitcoin, but the blockchain. Those customers are living in an environment where they want to have a kind of signature to a, a digital contract, you know, not in, in physical, but in a digital way. Um, our kids won't know a signature anymore. Our kids won't know a branch anymore. I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, our kids, you know, they, 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 they think a phone never had a wire. You know, that's... But we all, the, the other ones, uh, remember it's still uh, very vital. So I think it's, it's very fast changing. Uh, digitalization means a, a profound, total change of IT architecture. Right. Uh, and if you do not do this, you cannot answer that development with an app. That's, that's the wrong language and the wrong problem. So you're probably saying that you know, the, the, the way you organize itself tells you what you're focused on. So if you're organized around the ability to develop um, apps and, and you, that's the skill set in, in your, your core skill sets, then, then that's what you do, uh, as opposed to you know, building apps for app, app sake or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. You know. But we, we experience a lot of banks building apps for app sake. Uh, and, and this is what we deny um, on the one side. On the other side, we want to build an operating system or we build an operating system that is open to third party apps and accessible via APIs. This is digital. You know, it's not that you have a team building an app because then you would uh, assume that your app is the best. It's, so tell, it's probably tell me a not. Bit, talk to me a little bit about this sort of thing called a network effect. Because what you're saying is that by, by being a web 2.0, mm -hmm. uh, you are opening yourself up and you don't know who your competitors are but, and you don't know what will come out of it, but being out there and being networked is, is the reality, is the... Mm -hmm. um, is the proposition, mm -hmm. you know, so, so anyone can connect with you and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Whereas banks today think, think proprietary. They think Absolutely. Boxes. Boxes. Um, talk to us a little bit about what then becomes the, um, your thinking model uh, in terms of networking. Are you, are you thinking, give me more networks, give me more networks, who else can I network with? Are you thinking that way? Or are you thinking, okay, I see all the networks, I don't care what's out there, some will work, some will not work, but what is my core proposition? Um, you know, and, and then do you worry that when, 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 your, when your customer base is not proliferating because, you know, the touch points are not touching, uh, you mm. know, the customers are not, uh, you know, in a way it's, it's, it's about scaling quickly, isn't it? Um, it's, not, it's not incremental, the, the kind of success that you need to see in terms of, you know, touch points, in terms of engagement, in terms of, um, you know, people buying things. Okay, I try to answer that in, in, in uh, sequences. So first of all, um, scaling quickly, yes, as, as much as we can with our regulatory capital. So I come back to my oh, capital okay. increase, yeah. okay, because this is the limiting factor. 
at least I found it to be a limiting factor, or, and of course it's meant to be limiting, because uh, the tier one capital or ca regulatory capital is limiting our loan book growth, uh, and the loan book, as I mentioned, should be in our loan book to deposit ratio should be something like 80% of the deposits. Um, so this is the limiting factor itself. Uh, besides all technological issues and so on, this is the core limiting factor. Um, just forgetting this for a second, um, of course we try to scale as efficient as possible. And uh, an efficient scaling means definitely to be open to any kind of a viral effect or to be open to whatever kind of a uh, suitable and fitting environment out there. So this also can mean that sometimes you have to camouflage yourself and then we call it white label. Uh, because, for instance, we are in talks with whatever kind of a social media platform, integrating our way of banking frictionlessly, really totally seamless into this social media profiles, so that you have one button maybe send this person a message and the next button is send this person money and participate in crowd finance, but in the look and feel of the partner. Uh, this is one way of growing, this is one way of using our technology and banking license. On the other side, um, we are absolutely open to developers, and developers are uh, startup entrepreneurs or parts of a startup team. Uh, having a, they are business owners in the best meaning, and and what we receive as a feedback from those guys is it's totally difficult to approach a bank in a technical way. Why? Because as you said, the bank is thinking in a box, and that's it. That's our issue. That's our process. No openness, no nothing. What we, what we want to make actually is life's easy. It's our life and their life. So our life is easy if we do not have to onboard everybody with hands and, and like print work and so on. But if they can do it their own actually. So if they have uh, an access to our API browser, they find the API specification, they can download it, it's man readable, it's machine readable. You know, it's very easy to, to understand. It's, it's, I would say, uh, in 15 minutes you can digest the information and, and start coding. Um, and then you have a machine-to-account communication. Wow, that's, that's, I would say, this is what digital banking is about. Um, yeah, and of course we have to see who's the account owner then, because we offer API, for instance, only with accounts, so this means that's a KYC person, that's a KYC organization, so we take care of the security of uh, money laundry stuff. Uh, and so on, and, and that's a very trusted relation then, but in a very scalable sense. Uh, on, the live, on the asset side of your business, would you, would you take into consideration models like crowd lending, for example? Is, you know, that in other words, you're mixing and matching models which don't come from banking. Yeah, we are absolutely open to do so, uh, and we, but we are not organizing those projects on our own, uh, but we rely on partners which we are integrating in FidoSmart cash account. This means today in, in the German version of the cash account you already find five different offers of crowd funders uh, in whatever way. Is it crowd lending, crowd finance, you know, no differentiation at this point. But um, we are not organizing the project but we are supporting those platforms by A, listing them in our account which makes the account by the way an, an ecosphere, an ecosystem. The account suddenly is a marketplace. First of all, second, we support it by processes, processes, and and third of all, then by maybe data exchange because customers of Fiverr then should be in a position to onboard very easily to a crowd finance platform because we could via API, by the way, deploy the information whether. But, but why aren't you in crowd crowdfunding? Our, crowd, uh, crowd our own, yeah. our own. Well, there are so many good offers out there. First of all, second, we have the philosophy of offering variety. And we are not, we are not third, not the typical thinking bank saying, if we do not do this on our own, we do not do it. This is not our thinking. We think we cannot do everything on our own. We see, we see so many good innovations going on out there. Um, we cannot cope with that. And then, by the way, we want to be international. So I'm exfolding this problem and the challenge. We have some good in Germany. We have even more good in the UK, in the US. Should we do this on our own? It's totally impossible. So in order to embrace the development in the right speed, actually, you need to be open. This is your only answer to do so. No organization on this planet will cope with every kind of innovative development on a proprietary level. Forget it. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that answer is because um, you can't scale on your own. And a part of the reason for the answer is because 
uh, you respect the network effect in itself. Uh, Absolutely. 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 I would disrespect it if I would say, listen, I... I, I want to do that. I can we do know that. some e-commerce concepts, actually, that integrate you first, read your data for two years, and then they do it on their own. This is not what we want to do. And, and this is... No, we are fully respecting that. We say, we do a proper clearing. Um, we run FIDO operating system. You are happy to be integrated there. We will come up with an app store to the account, so you will be in the app store. Customers can see you in the app store. Uh, that's the next. Uh, we run our banking balance and license. That's what we stand for, and this is what we do. This is our focus, actually. If we would now do everything what they do, we would be totally defocusing, which would not be a good thing on the one side. But we are not crossing the fence. We are remaining in this fence saying, okay, or on this side of the fence, saying, okay, this you can be sure. We, by that, protect your customers, do what you do. Uh, I think they do a proper job in organizing those projects. Mm. So, so, but why in Bitcoin do you, did you not? Uh, did, why in Bitcoin are you taking a, a proprietary approach? Uh, you know, you own the you own a Bitcoin um, model yourself. I mean, uh, no, 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 no. You you you, you provide di Bitcoin deposits. No, what we what we what 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 is a Bitcoin deposit? Um, no, what we do is we're partnering with, uh, with, for instance, a Bitcoin exchange in uh, Germany. Okay. So, so, the, so, the, so the Bitcoin, well, Bitcoin is a little bit interesting because um, there is no float in a Bitcoin, or the float sits with the exchange, not with you. I mean, it, you know, in, in real money, uh, uh, you would be a deposit-taking company. And I'm in this environment as well, but it's a euro deposit, as they would say, a fiat money deposit, and we, we, are, we do nothing else what we, what we learn from stock brokerage. You know, you would not ask me that question if we would be a stock broker, but we do nothing different. So this stock exchange, actually, this Bitcoin exchange actually is doing the Bitcoin transaction. Like on the stock market, there's a stock transaction, okay? This is what they do. Now, we integrated uh, via API, by the way, uh, a, a real-time clearing in a euro currency subsequent to the Bitcoin exchange transaction. Yes. This, is, this is all what we did. So why get any exciting about it? You know, yes. This is a funny thing. Because the, the, all what we do is then that we get the information from the Bitcoin exchange. Customer A sold XYZ Bitcoins to customer B for whatever kind of a value. Please clear from customer B to customer A a euro transaction. This is what we do. Matthias Kuhner, it was really exciting speaking to you. We, talk, we were discussing a number of things which are, which are new rules as they are being created. And it's very not nice to know that you know, you're there making them happen. Thank, Thank you very you much. Very much.